The Seven Most Evil People in the Bible Number 1. Nimrod Nimrod is a legendary biblical figure in the book of Genesis and Chronicles. This occurred after Noah's time. He is a descendant of Cush, who ruled over the land of Shinar. Nimrod eventually became the father of two of the Bible's and world history's greatest empires, Assyria and Babylon. He was the first world civilization's great leader. Regrettably, he also led the world astray from God. Babel is often thought to be the same as Babylon, which Nimrod is recorded as founding in Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. Some Bible translations list this city as Babel rather than Babylon. Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kelmi in the land of Shinar, in Babylonia. People desired to construct a tower that reached into God's sphere of heaven, effectively challenging heaven. According to the text, they wanted to make a name for themselves. God was outraged by the Tower of Babel. He said that if he let them continue, there was no telling where it would end. So God gave tongues for the first time to confuse the people. They could no longer understand each other. From then on, humanity split, scattering and speaking different languages. There is an interesting footnote to the story of Babel. The people at Babylon, Babel, declared independence, not from another nation, but from God himself. They were embracing a type of humanism. Number 2. Jezebel, Queen of Israel In the Old Testament, Jezebel was King Ahab's wife. It was abundantly evident that she utilized Ahab to accomplish her nefarious goals and he did not require much convincing. This was the first time that a king of Israel had allied himself by marriage with a heathen princess. She worshipped Baal. Jezebel came to the conclusion that she would practice the satanic cult of Baal in place of the worship of the Lord God. The practice of Baal worship became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab and the practice of Baal worship also affected Judah. Baal is depicted in the sculptures wearing a helmet embellished with a bull's horns, a symbol of strength and fertility. He holds a club or mace in one hand, probably representing thunder, and a spear adorned with leaves in the other, possibly representing both lightning and vegetation. After they were married, Jezebel successfully convinced Ahab to accept Baal. She was a woman who craved more power and sought to silence anybody who tried to challenge her authority. She was not directed by any principles, was not constrained by any fear of either God or man, and was zealous in her commitment to the pagan worship that she practiced. She spared no effort to retain idolatry in its grandeur around her. Her actions were, in many ways, extremely detrimental to the kingdoms of both Israel and Judah. Chapter 21 of 1 Kings traces the events leading up to Jezebel and Ahab's death. In Jezreel, there was a palace owned by Ahab and Jezebel. Next to the palace, was a vineyard owned by Naboth, the Jezreelite. Ahab wanted to take the vineyard to plant a vegetable garden there. Naboth refused to sell or exchange his land, since the law of Israel decreed that property should remain in the family to which it was initially assigned. When Jezebel found her spouse annoyed and grumpy and learned of Naboth's refusal to sell his vineyard, she assured Ahab that the vineyard would soon be his. Jezebel killed Naboth by carrying false tales. 
Jezebel ordered the deaths of Naboth's boys because she knew that the inheritance would go to them following their father's passing. The wicked queen was as methodical as she was evil in approaching her evil schemes. Elijah ran into Ahab as he was on his way to seize ownership of the vineyard. Elijah said that Ahab would be slain, that dogs in Jezreel would devour the body of Jezebel, and that Ahab's descendants would not be given a proper burial. Jezebel even slayed God's prophets. 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 4 For when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave, and provided them with bread and water. She also tried her best to slay Elijah. Elijah, fearing for his life, made his way to Horeb. A few years later, Ahab was slain in a battle against the Syrians, and Jezebel continued to rule for nearly another ten years after his death. Her death happened according to prophecy prophesied. If you think Jezebel was the worst, let me introduce you to her daughter. Number 3. Athaliah, Queen of Judah Athaliah she was the daughter of Ahab, king of Israel. She got married to Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. She proved herself to be a wicked queen, just like her mother, Queen Jezebel. She sat on King David's throne. Her name means afflicted by God. Athaliah, who had already lost her husband and then her son, took the kingdom for herself by executing her own grandchildren. Unbeknownst to Athaliah, a single grandchild escaped the massacre. Just like her mother, she worshipped the god known as Baal. After Athaliah had reigned for six years, the high priest Jehoiada placed guards around the temple and publicly crowned the young Joash as the fitting king. As the new king was anointed, the people clapped their hands and shouted, Long live the king! 2 Chronicles chapter 23 verses 12 through 13 When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. She looked, and behold, the king was standing by his pillar at the entrance and the captains and the trumpeters were beside the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets, the singers with their musical instruments leading the praise. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and said, Conspiracy! Conspiracy! Queen Athaliah came to the people in the temple to investigate the cheering and shouting, only to find a child rival she thought long dead now wearing a royal crown. But what must have alarmed her even more was the realization that the people were solidly behind him. No one listened to her charge of treason. After all, she was the usurper, not Joash. Jehoiada ordered her to be slain. Number 4. The Antichrist let me clarify the true meaning of the term Antichrist. The word Christ is from the Greek word Christos, which exactly corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. So when we say Antichrist, that means anti-Messiah. Anti is a Greek preposition. It has two meanings, and both of them apply. First of all, it means against. So the first operation is against Messiah. The second meaning is in place of. The ultimate purpose is to replace the true Messiah with a false Messiah. Scripture makes clear, there will be one last most evil, most powerful ruler who will rule mankind for a short time 
who will be the Antichrist. The third form is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is a spirit that works through every Antichrist. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more the spirit of the Antichrist will intensify and the more we will find ourselves engaging it in battle. I want to examine some passages of scripture so that you are not unaware of what Satan is planning. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul dealt with the emergence, revelation, and manifestation of the Antichrist. He also addressed preparation for the Lord's return. These actions are closely intertwined because the final satanic act before the return of the Lord will be the revealing of the Antichrist. Paul says, in fact, that the Lord will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. So we see three different names for the same being, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and the son of perdition. And we are given one other important name in Revelation 13. This is part of the vision that John had. The fourth title is The Beast, a person who is going to arise to whom Satan, the dragon, will impart his power. Why will Satan give his power to that person? Because this will enable that person to gain dominion over the entire human race and convince all mankind to do the one thing Satan most desires, to worship him. That's his goal. He's been working patiently on it for many centuries, and he's very close to his achievement. God's installed ruler does not have the nature of the beast. He has the nature of the lamb, and he is exalted above all others because he gave his life. He has humbled himself, and he has walked in the way of meekness and humility because he did not resist his arrests and persecutors. I believe that the church must show the same nature these days. In Revelation chapter 13 verses 6 through 7, we see the Antichrist take action. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, people, language, and nation. He is the open challenger of God. He is not a secret enemy. He shakes his fist in the face of Almighty God. Number 5. Manasseh Manasseh was born, who would go on to become one of the most wicked of all the kings. At the age of 12, Manasseh became king, and he set out to destroy all of his father's accomplishments. He was a very wicked man. According to the Bible, he was involved in some of Israel's or Judah's worst idolatry. 2 Chronicles chapter 33 verses 1 through 6. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the repulsive acts of the pagan nations, whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons, descendants of Israel. For he rebuilt the idolatrous high places which his father Hezekiah had torn down, and he set up altars for the Baals, and made the Asherim, and worshipped all the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, stars and planets, and served them. He built pagan altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, My name shall be in Jerusalem forever. He built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire as an offering to his gods in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, and he practiced witchcraft, 
used divination and practiced sorcery, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He installed gods everywhere, including in God's temple, where people worshipped other gods. Then, in disobedience to the second commandment, Manasseh began to worship idols. And here we see that Manasseh made Israel, raised up altars for Baal and made groves, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. All the people were worshippers. They worshipped the stars. Some sources even claim that Manasseh assassinated a God-sent prophet. God's judgment fell, and Jerusalem was seized, and all the goods they had gathered, as well as all the money, silver and gold, were taken to Babylon. Manasseh was not put to death. Instead, he was taken to Babylon in shackles and imprisoned in a dark, damp dungeon where he was tormented by his conscience. He had plenty of time to think about his bad activities. Number 6. Cain Cain, the farmer who slew his brother. A person can have no more significant negative impact than when they take the life of another. It all started at the beginning of human history. Now the man, Adam, was having marital intercourse with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and had Cain. She had just created a man just like the Lord did. Notice that the very first killing occurred within the second generation of humanity. This points us to an undeniable theological truth we learn from Genesis 4. We are not sinners because we have sinned. Because we are sinners, we sin. The issue is in the heart. Murder results from a perverted, selfish disposition that arose in all humanity due to Adam and Eve's sin in Genesis 3. Another point to consider, the first homicide occurs in Genesis 4. We observe innocence in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve had an unrestricted closeness with each other and with God. Cain became enraged and sullen as a result of his wrongdoing and God's just reaction. Cain was probably envious, plain and simple. He didn't want his younger brother to outdo him. Cain's envy was most likely sparked by God's favor on Abel's sacrifice. Cain was angry and took out his rage on Abel, yet the younger brother did nothing wrong. Cain was eventually faced with his transgression by the Lord, but take note of his hardening. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? And he replied, I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Genesis chapter 4 verses 9 through 10. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain's wickedness rendered crop production impossible, putting a stop to his livelihood. Number 7. Herodias, Queen of Galilee Herodias is known as an evil queen, and the fact that she was responsible for the execution of John the Baptist will ensure that she is never forgotten. She persuaded Herod Antipas to arrest John and throw him in jail, which Herod did as a result of her efforts. 